Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Uh, if you just go over to questions, Aaron. Um, so uh, thank you. That was really a wonderful um, and complimentary talk. So thank you for coordinating. I, I think two questions. One uh, about uh, FGFR2 inhibition. It sounds like there might be an opportunity for non-mutated patients to benefit from this. So. I don't know the clinical experience. Is there any suggestion that patients without enrichment for mutations in the pathway benefit from it along the lines of, of via YAP activation? Uh, and then secondly, for Luke, um, you know, WINT inhibitors in the clinic, um, should we be looking for opportunities to enrich you? Uh, I've tended to, to uh, look at models without a specific regard to a genotype? Is that something to be looking for, or is there a, an opportunity there? So I guess those two questions to start things off. Um, so just to, so your question was whether FGFR2 inhibition, what we know about it in the clinical realm in patients who may be yet positive? No, non-mutated. Yeah, or well, non-mutated. Not, oh, you mean patients who don't um, carry FGFR, who don't have FGFR2 genetic aberrations. Um, so I, I, I don't know as far as in the clinical realm, um, you know, because we think that these data serve as a premise to um, use YAP as a biomarker um, in addition to what we've already been doing with FGFR inhibition, utilizing, uh, assessing genetic aberrations and FGFR2 gene fusions. Um, so we think that one of the, the significant things with, with this data is, is to utilize the YAP expression, which you know, we can do via immunohistochemistry. Um, as far as whether we have any clinical experience with that, uh, not, not as of yet. We have not employed uh, um, uh, assessment of YAP uh, expression. I haven't seen any results of patients who don't have abnormalities of FGFR signaling responding. Got a comment from Katie. I think that the RQL study did have about nine or ten patients without FGFR2 fusion who were treated, and none of them had a response in their phase one at least. Luke? Uh, so certainly I think there is a, an argument to stratify based on these wind signaling inhibitors. So the benefit I see for the ICG001 is it actually interacts fairly far downstream, so it regulates transcription through beta catenin. So if in a broad population of patients there is upregulation of the WIMP pathway, then I think that would be the inhibitor of choice. Certainly though, uh, with things like the OSPO um, fusion patients, then a, an inhibitor that hits perhaps further up the pathway would be beneficial. The concern has always been that mutations in the core machinery, so beta catenin, axin, APC have bypassed a lot of the therapeutic inhibitors. And so I think it's only now we're starting to see this generation of small molecules that connect downstream of those mutations. And I think that's interesting. Thank you, John. Question about the FGFR resistance mechanisms, please. Um, the, the Lily compound that, that, that looks so good, uh, I may have missed it. What, what is it? What, what type of compound is it? And, and what is it about it that makes it so good? Um, it's an ATP competitive oral uh, FGFR inhibitor. That it's, it's an FGFR inhibitor. It is an F yeah. All of those were FGFR inhibitors. Okay. Yes. And and did you get a feel for why it was so much better than anything else? You know, it has um, a similar potency to the other drugs in terms of the IC50s for FGFR one through three. It does have some other targets besides FGFR but we don't have preclinical data yet as to really understanding why the Lilly compound is the most potent. It might be something structural. Katie. Um, this is a question probably for Lipica or Elizabeth regarding mechanisms of resistance. Um, as we look at the plethora of FGFR2 inhibitors approaching the clinic, one of the challenges is this balance of dose frequency and intensity versus toxicity, and some of the strategies are scheduled interruptions, like BGJ-398, where dosing is daily for three weeks and one week off, versus QOD strategies, versus higher dose with longer breaks or more chronic low dose. And so 
I guess my question is with respect to the mechanisms of resistance that you've studied, is there a rationale where scheduled breaks might be more deleterious and promote resistance mutations versus is it more cytotoxic to have a higher dose with pulses? It's a great question. I don't think we know. <laughs> and can this, I guess the question for Elizabeth is can this be modeled in an effective way to predict how we should handle it clinically? What do you think about the difference in the mutation spectra between the, the cell lines that were treated with high doses of PGJ398 versus low doses? I mean, I guess that is a dosing issue about in terms of the level of dose as opposed to a dose interruption issue. So yes, I mean, obviously to make BGJ tolerable, tolerable based on the phase one data, they had to have that one week off in order to like help get the phosphate down and get people onto the second um, cycle. Um, if we keep on going, but then patients aren't able to tolerate it. So if you keep on going for four to six weeks, but then you have to take a two week break, might that be more deleterious? Um, in terms of just being able to get good dose density over time. You know, I know other other um, inhibitors are trying an every other day schedule versus an everyday schedule and seeing if that makes a difference, but I think our data on resistance clinically is so immature that it's hard to tell whether or not um, dose interruptions in that way, because you can have scheduled dose interruptions and then you can have unplanned dose interruptions. And so it's hard to know exactly what schedule is gonna help people the most. I think what might potentially make a bigger difference too is the potency of the drugs. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, uh, can I go back to the FGFR um, potencies? Because the potencies that you gave were in vitro potencies. That is the, the potency determined in a cell-free assay. The in, vi the in vivo, the cell potency is often much higher, um, i.e less potent um, when you actually do it on a cell line and it varies from cells to cells. So do you know if there's any relationship between the Lily compounds IC50 for an in-cell assay versus the other ones? Because it might be that, that what it's doing is it's actually acting at a much lower concentration than you think it's acting at or much. So I, I don't think the Lily compound has yet been tested in FGFR resistant, in patients with FGFR resistant tumors yet. So in terms of knowing, but it just will just in an in an in vitro assay, a cell a cell assay, you grow grow some cholangiac carcinoma cells and see what concentration you get actually FGFR inhibition, uh -huh. and is that shift very different from the other compounds that were not able to affect it? Because it might be that 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 it, it's acting at sub micromolar concentrations, and the other ones actually are not acting at those concentrations. They've got to go to ten micromolar or higher. Yeah, it's a good question. The data from those figures were all done with Novartis, actually. They were yeah. an integral part of uh, doing all, that. and I want to thank them, actually, also, for all the in vitro work that we did. So we didn't end up extensively studying the Lily compound further, but it is an interest of ours to study that drug further. They probably have it. that data. What's that? They probably have that data, at least for some cancer types. Thank you, Nabil. A comment on, the, on that is that, uh, that Indeed, we need cell lines that have the endogenous translocation that we can use to answer, answer that question. And I'm sure in the next year, we're going to see a lot of that sort of data where we can look at the cellular IC50s and, and so on on the real uh, translocated alleles and on real acquired resistance uh, mutations rather than tra uh, transfected systems. I'm, I'm very mindful that we're in the company of, of patients and, and there was a question that was asked at the break and uh, I'd like to pass that on to you guys. So we're talking very often about cholangiocarcinoma as a single entity. We're all aware that it's, it's a heterogeneous group of tumors. So um, specifically the question that I was asked was, uh, is what we're talking about apply equally to extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas to intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas? Maybe start off with Luke. So, uh, no. In our experience, we've looked typically at intrahepatic glandiocarcinoma as a model. Uh, if you look at the activation of the Wnt pathway between intra- and extrahepatic tumors, it is different. And certainly the um, inflammatory milieu around those two tumors is also different. So I fully expect that uh, these, two, these drugs that we've looked at will function differently in the two cancer types. Thank you. Does somebody to comment on... FGFR? Well, I think that we haven't really seen that in extrahepatic glandular carcinoma, so therefore there are other biomarkers to test for in, in that disease that might be more useful for the patient. Yeah, and I think it's important to um, realize and recognize that the anatomic subtypes are very different uh, in terms of 
um, their molecular characterization. I think the Nakamura paper was key in that it highlighted the different genetic aberrations in the different um, subtypes, and that's really clinically that's very very relevant because you know F, as we know FGFR aberrations they tend to be present in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So for our patients who have perihilar cholangiocarcinoma, it may not be as relevant. Um, so I, I would say that the the, the different subtypes, it, they are very different as far as their molecular characterization. They have some overlap, but some of these um, aberrations that we're focusing on, like IDH mutations, FGFR uh, aberrations, uh, they tend to be more prevalent in, uh, um, in uh, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, and we don't really see them in the perihylers or the distals as much. Thank you. I hope that answers the question from the patient group. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank the panel and uh, let you go.